just thank you for filling this place with your sweet spirit. Thank you for letting us feel your presence, for worship over every one of us, wrapping your arms of love around us, filling us with your spirit. We worship you and we give you presence this evening in Jesus' name. Lord bless you. You may be seated. Can you imagine that's what the three Hebrew children were thinking whenever they stepped out against King Nebuchadnezzar? Lord, let your presence be in this place. They was facing certain death. They knew what was end up going on. But Eric, so good to see you. Knew exactly what was end up going on. Asked God's blessings to be upon them. But then was stepping out in faith saying, hey, King, we don't know what may happen. But our God is able. He may not do it. We don't know. We're not God. But I'm going to step into that situation. Some of you have been stressed out. You can tell this prop back here being built didn't just happen. All the practice that's going in, everything that's happening, it can be a stressful time. But you're not facing that alone. Whenever they stepped into that fiery furnace, there was another person that was with them. God was with them and comforted them, was able to take care of them. Your situation, whatever it is, God can step into that situation, make everything right. Then you have a miracle to tell. Look what God has done. Amen. For ushers will come and receive the tithe and the offering. We're going to need a little bit more money if we're going to carry on the construction of the sanctuary and finish this out. Appreciate Brother Jeremy Ray. I don't know if there's others who helped with that, but I wasn't here last evening. My wife said there was hammering going on all evening. Appreciate all the work that's gone into this. Let's ask God's blessings upon the remainder of the service. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for letting us be a part of your kingdom, a part of what you're doing. Ask you to bless this tithe and offering as we give it back to you with joy. Ask your blessings upon the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, it's easy to say, Lord, I give you everything. You take control and you recognize there's no good thing in me anyway. And if I give that back to God, then something good can start to happen. When God knows, you know what, Jason's not going to think he's the one doing that. He's going to recognize it's God's doing it. Well, the Ralph's not going to thank God that he's doing something great. He's going to recognize God's doing it with him. Then God has an opportunity. You know what? But the Sean just may be humble enough right now to let glory start happening. As the church starts moving in the way the pastor's wanting it to happen, believing it's happening, casting that vision, every one of us had that opportunity to say, let myself die and let God spring forth. Whenever I submit everything to him, wonderful things are going to happen. I look forward to seeing it. We had a great testimony this evening wanted to share with you. For the Stephen sister Amber, as you know, have been in the process of adopting their wonderful children who have grown up in here and just have been their children for all these years. But they said it's just one step away from happening now. It's just kind of the process is in motion. One more court date. And they want to testify. I said, is this a milestone? Is this a milestone? And they said, oh my goodness, this is a huge one. This is the last one, really. So I just wanted to praise the Lord for that. Congratulate them. Looking forward to doing a good thing. Fellowship with one another. We'll enjoy the word of the Lord here in just a minute as Bishop brings us the word.
Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, Jesus said, Lay not up to yourselves treasures on the earth, where moths and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal, but rather lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where that's just not the case. Thieves do not break through and steal, and robbers do not take away. Verse 21 says, For where your treasure is. That's our text for tonight. Where's your treasure? Tell me where your treasure is, and I'll tell you where your heart is. I've oftentimes said motive is everything. Tell me what your motive is, and I'll tell you what you're going to do. I was talking to a preacher the other day about the situation, dealing with somebody, and I just cut him short as he began to go into a story, and I said, tell me what you want. Tell me what your motive in dealing with these people or not dealing with these people are. Tell me what your motive is. And he stopped, got real quiet. I said, it makes it easier on both of us. If you'll tell me your motive, I'll tell you what you're going to do. And so Jesus is simply saying, tell me where your treasure is. If it's in the right place, your heart's in the right place. I want to review a bit, if you don't mind. The uh, uh, men upstairs have the notes, but you'll be getting yours shortly. i uh, running tight on time. And you think, that's strange, because December the 28th last year, I taught a second lesson on stewardship. And I thought, you know, surely I'll just uh, uh, familiarize myself afresh. And after 26 hours of research and uh, pondering and uh, uh, trying to put it together, you know, here I am running a bit late. I had a preacher, I had a young man ask me in Mississippi several months ago when I was visiting down there, and they asked me to preach. And so I spent the day with my Bible. I was sitting on his front porch and, and uh, with my Bible, and he said, how much time do you put in a sermon? I said, on average, about 12 hours, but I'm going to make an exception here and just do it in eight. But uh, so here we go. 
Last, year, last week I taught on faithful stewardship as the key to joy-filled life in the kingdom of God. And we defined ownership. God owns it all, even our own body and spirit. And we defined stewardship, which means that we don't own anything. We're just managing it responsibly for God because we are accountable. I said we are all stewards. We're all ministers. Remember the motto of the church, every member of this congregation, a minister to this community. And we all are to be salt and truth worshipers. Or pardon me, spirit and truth worshipers. We are to be salt and light witnesses. We are to be happy and glad or joyful servants. And we are to be good and faithful stewards. And we are to be modeling. Turn to your neighbor and say, we are to be modeling. No, not in a limelight, not with a dress or a pair of pants or whatever. But we are to be modeling ministry. And we are to do that through power, through people, through purity, through proficiency, and through purpose. If you want to know what all of that means, go to the fellowship hall and look at what's been on the wall. I told someone the other day, I said, whenever I asked the Lord to help me to help the men's minister, whoever director is, to uh, touch up things around the church, I usually ask the Lord, give me the eyes of a first-time visitor because they see everything. But we who have been here for a long while don't see anything. And we know where we're going to go. You know exactly what row of pews you're going to sit on, or seats you're going to sit on. You find one. If somebody's there, you want to say, get out of my chair. You know, not really. But you know what I'm talking about. And so I'm just saying we need to be modeling ministry. We talked about our multifacet relationship with Jesus Christ from a child to a servant to a steward to a member of the bride and a, and a, a member of the body. We talked about the 613 laws of the Torah and how that in Jesus Christ they were refined down to two. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Help me with the next two words. With all. And you can stop right there and get the gist of it. And you're to love your neighbor as yourself. We talked about the fact that all proper relationships, vertical and horizontal, flow out of the greatest of all commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all. We said you can love. Uh, you can uh, give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You can never outgive or out squeeze God. I added that last phrase because when we get to Malachi, we'll find that God said, I will turn your blessing into a curse. Many years ago, I was called by a person who once before had sent to this church. Their uh, uh, loved one was in the hospital with pneumonia, and, they, and I hadn't seen them for years. And uh, this mother said, would you please go and see them? And I said, did they call you and ask you to call me? They said, no, but uh, she said, no, but I, I'm sure, Brother Lashley, they'd love to see you. I said, I'm sure they would not love to see me. Brother Lashley, would you please go? I said, sure, I'll go uh, because you asked. I went. The doctor was in the room. I stood waiting outside the little uh, drape until the doctor pulled it back and started to walk out. And when I stepped out, the individual looked at me and said, you, what are you doing here? I said, your mother called me, asked me would I come and see you. I'm not interested in seeing you. And immediately the Holy Ghost come upon me. I said, thus saith the Lord. You continue to harden your heart and stiffen your neck, and I will turn your blessing into a curse. He looked at me and he said, you think you scare me? I don't care what you say. I said, I knew that before I ever got in my car and drove up here. God said in Malachi, yea, I will turn your blessing into a curse. And then he went on to say, yea, I have already turned your blessing into a curse. So you can't outgive God. You can't outforgive God. You can't outlove God. But you definitely can't outsqueeze God either. And I really don't want to be in that squeeze. Amen? I really and truly don't. Okay, if you want God to bless everything you put your hand to, then don't be a Scrooge. Don't be a taker. Be generous. Be generous with everything you have, your time, your talent, etc., and etc. Be generous to God. Be generous to his people. Be generous to everybody. What does it cost you to smile? And most of the time when you smile, you get one back. 
So you got two, yours and theirs as well. Either you believe the promises of God when you read the Bible or you believe he's a liar. There is no middle ground. I remember standing in the pulpit right here. By the way, this is the, last, this is the first time I've ever taught outside the house. But uh, <clears throat> standing in the pulpit right here, and a little lady walked up to me, and she said, I want to ask you a question. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, uh, what must I do? And I said, oh, just one minute. Uh, you have a Bible? She said, I do. And I opened it real quick to Acts chapter 2, verse 37, turned around, head to her, said, read verse 37. Please read it out loud so I'll know that you really are reading the verse I asked. And uh, she read it out loud. And I said, is that your question? She said, absolutely. That's exactly what I'm asking. I said, then why don't you let the Bible answer your question? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise is to you, to your children, them that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. If God's called you, that's your answer. She looked at me and she said, well, I'll have to pray about that. I said, pardon me, ma'am. She said, what do you mean? I said, I don't think I've ever witnessed such arrogance. You got one shot. You got one shot with some people. You know it's a cure or kill. It's a yea or a nay. God don't play in the shadows, folks. He is love and he knows how to love. But he's tough love too sometimes. Can you say amen? That rich young ruler only lacked one thing. And if Jesus had a graded on the curve, he'd have passed him on the spot. But it didn't matter that he just lacked one thing, that he was 99% where he ought to be. The Lord said, one thing lackest thou. And put his finger right on it. Right on it. God has a unique way of touching the nerve, doesn't he? And it's not always nice. It don't feel good when you touch the nerve. I said, ma'am, I have never in my life met anybody with such arrogance. You've read the word for yourself and admitted that's your question. And you've got your answer. And you're going to pray about it? I don't think all the prayers that you can pray for the rest of your life will change what God has written 2,000 years ago. It's in the book. That's why we are to walk in the light as he is in the light and let the scripture minister to us. Either you believe the word of God or you think God's lying. There's just no middle ground. We talked about generosity. Generosity is an expression of love. And then we talked about tight-fistedness. It is an expression of selfishness. And we made this statement toward the end. Neither you nor your immediate family nor this local church family will ever reach the full potential God's ordained without your faithful stewardship. It matters whether you are faithful in your stewardship or not. Children catch what is most important to their parents. I don't care what you say to them. They catch it. Hello? If it's important to you, they catch it. And we said, what? is the most important to you what attitude about money tithe offering personal involvement with the church do you want to pass on to your children and we said faithful stewardship is the key to a joyful life of blessings in the kingdom of God and that's the life that you want to live you want that life for your children and your children's children so the question is lovest thou me wasn't that what the Lord asked Peter lovest thou me more than these dollar signs, okay? God's kingdom, first and foremost, is a kingdom of the heart. Now, it'd be very easy for me to jump right into Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8 and say, will a man rob God? But before you get to God's bringing them to toe scratch, I mean, here you are to the snubbing pole. You that's ever broke a horse or know anything about breaking horses, you'll know what the snubbing pole is. But God just brought them right there in chapter 3 and verse 8. But way back in chapter 1, verse 2, he said, I have loved you. I have loved you. And you say, wherein have you loved me? He said, I chose Jacob. Esau I've hated. Jacob I loved. And I have loved you. And then he brings them to the snubbing poles after he tells them, you have polluted my table. You have defiled my sacrifices. You have offered me the sick, the lame, the cripple, the leftovers. You have said it was a weariness of you to attend my table. There's not a one of you, he said, that would even open the door for naught. I got to pay you to get you to do anything. 
And he said, and not only have I paid you, but you've robbed me. You've stolen from me. You have to read the book of Malachi for yourself. God never jumps into judgment. He always sets the stage with the expression of his love. Can you say amen? We deal with a loving God. His kingdom is first and foremost a kingdom of the heart. And if we don't get the heart right, we don't get the focus right, we don't get our emotions lined up with what's right in the sight of God, all the rules and regulations that Moses inspired of God to write will be ignored, negated, sidestepped, hello, loopholed, it's amazing. I, I read some study on uh, uh, the Sabbath and the Jewish traditions that was in vogue when Jesus was on the earth. And the rabbis taught at that time that if you come by and saw a wall fall on a man, I mean those masonry walls, those stone walls, you saw a wall fall on a man on a Sabbath, then you run to the wall and you are at liberty to dig enough stones away to see if he's a Jew or not. And if he's not a Jew, you walk on to leave him. Loopholes from a God of love and justice and righteousness. God always sets the stage. Be generous, okay? We live, we give, and we forgive from the heart. Proverbs 23 and 7. You remember a few weeks ago I taught as a man thinketh in his heart. So is he. He may say thus and thus, but his heart's not with you. And in religious circles, the humanity has proven that they can say all kinds of thus and thus to God. Jesus said, they profess with their lips, but their heart is far from me. God's external laws are merely a plumb line and a level that is set against our lives to reveal shortcomings. And then once we come face to the face with our impossibilities to really live a righteous life on our own, it directs us to our Lord Jesus as our Savior. Galatians chapter 3. I'm sorry I can't give you the exact verse. You've got it in your notes there. But it says that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us. Hello, the schoolmaster said, you failed. The schoolmaster said, you didn't keep the lesson. And then you said, but I couldn't. And the schoolmaster says, you're right. Let me take you the one that can take care of it for you. And so the external laws are plumb line. They're level. They just make us know what we are short in and point us to Jesus who makes up the difference. Alone, the law could never transform us. But on the other hand, new birth regeneration puts a new heart and spirit within us. It writes God's law of righteousness on our hearts and it imparts to us God's divine nature to enable, not to make us. Hello? The Holy Ghost does not command you or me to do anything. It'll enable us to do what's right. Hello? God will not make us. He will enable us to do what's right, to live pleasing in his sight. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 13 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. In other words, I want to walk in a worthy way to please God in everything I do being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience. And look at this, and long-suffering with joyfulness, not just enduring it, but enjoy, enduring it with that joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. How in the world do you go through the darkest, the deepest, the blackest of situations and have joy? J-E-S-U-S, -S, Jesus first, yourself last. J-O-Y, J-O-Y, this must surely mean Jesus first. Every day, sun shining, storm coming, whatever happens. Hello, water heater blows up. Come on, whatever happens, J-O-Y, learn how to endure joyful with joyfulness. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son.
Jesus taught us to pray, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then you'll notice what the prayer goes. It says, give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I mean, you want God to do that in your life. I want you to give me my daily bread. Why? So I'll have the strength to hallow your name, service your kingdom, fulfill your will. I want you to forgive me, Lord, of my trespasses. Why? Because I don't want condemnation to make me unable to lift up your name, service your kingdom, fulfill your will. Lord, lead me. Don't let me go into into temptation, but deliver me from it. Why? For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And I want to be a part of your kingdom that's hallowing your name, servicing your kingdom. Come on, and fulfilling your will. That's all a part of it. Being a happy Christian. I found the key, and now I've found the realization of fulfillment. I know how to be content and fulfilled. God's law sets the standards for life and then reveals that in ourselves we cannot attain unto those standards of righteousness. Therefore, God's law leads us to our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may be justified, regenerated, sanctified, glorified, experience salvation and walk with him God's law sets the standards and God's grace enables us to live up to them hello we don't just strike out and say oh I think this is what God wants that's what gives people four armed goddesses that's what gives people fish gods that's what gives people gods with with uh, uh, trident points spears etc it's all the imaginations of men But God sets the law or sets the standard with his word and then with his grace enables us to live it. That's beautiful. God still expects us to abide by the ethical and the moral principles of his Old Testament law, including the practice of tithing and giving. He said in Malachi chapter 3, is it verse 1, verse 6? Somebody help me. You can look it up. here. I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Do you ever stop to think, how does it mean that? When one time he was just an invisible little sail in a, a virgin's womb. One time he was just a little baby newborn wrapped in swaddling clothes. One time he was just a little boy. But he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's not talking about his humanity. That's talking about his deity. That's talking about Emmanuel. That's talking about God manifest in the flesh. Aren't you grateful you know him? Oh, hallelujah. And he doesn't change in his principles and his ethics. Hello? He does give additional ceremonial laws, et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera, that all fit into patterns that pointed toward and beyond. These were shadows and types, as the Scripture says. But the real Messiah was going to come in the fullness of time. God's principles and ethics and morals don't change. And his attitude about our stewardship doesn't change. Principles reveal so much about the character and the purposes of God. And even though following these regulations will not spiritually save us, they are an outflow of our personal relationship with Jesus. And as Christians, the Holy Ghost actually gives us the desire and the power to do the good and beneficial things of God's law, what is prescribed. Paul tells us very plainly in Romans chapter 7. Some scholars say this was in his this was his walk before he come to be born again others say this was his walk in carnality I'll just leave it with you it's not the average Christian experience because chapter 7 ends in failure chapter 7 is constantly saying what I would I don't and what I wouldn't I do hello chapter 7 is said I find in me a law and then chapter 8 it reveals it is the law of sin and death But it starts off saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Aren't you grateful that you have a spiritual reality that lives inside of you? And out of the depths of that spiritual reality, there is a flowing in the principles and the practices of God. Okay? Stewardship. 
Tithing and offering is not just a matter of Old Testament law. Long before God gave his Old Testament law, the Bible described the practice of tithing. Abraham tithed in response to God's faithfulness. In Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20, he met Miss Kimmel Kazadik and he paid him tithe of all. It was a because of the blessing. He was blessed because of what God had done for him. Jacob. In Genesis chapter 28, uh, tithe. He was Abraham's grandson. He covenanted with God to tithe as a thanksgiving for God saying, I'm with you. I've committed the promise to your grandfather and to your father to you, and I'm with you. And hey, Jacob wakes up and says, God was in this place, and I didn't know it. But he said, Lord, if you will go with me and keep me so that I can come again to my father in peace, then you'll be my God, and I'll pay you tithe of everything I get. That was 430 years or 480 years before the law of Moses, okay? The fact that God later instituted tithing as a part of his law just reveals how important it is as a way of honoring God and providing for God's ministry purposes. Malachi 1 and 2, I mentioned earlier, I have loved you, saith the Lord. And then he goes to verse 6. Malachi 1 and 6, he said, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where's mine honor? And if I be a master... Where is my fear or my reverence or my respect, saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name? And you say, Wherein have we despised thy name? Verse 7, You offered polluted bread upon mine altar. And you said, Wherein have we polluted thee? Let me back up and read it. In the original, there were no punctuation marks. So let me read it as I think it should be. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And you say, wherein we have polluted thee? The Lord said, you would dare ask that question? You're supposed to change the shoe bread every day. You let it go stale because you say the table of the Lord is a weariness. Why should we have to do this seven days a week? Why can't we just do it once a week or whatever? It goes on. Verse 8. Or verse 7. You offer polluted bread upon mine altar and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto your governor, and will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. And now I pray you, beseech God that he, may, that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the door for naught? In other words, he said, I, I couldn't get you to do anything just out of your heart. you got to be paid for it. Neither do you kindle fire on mine altars for naught. i got to take care of you. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. You make them, I won't accept them. Verse 11, for from the rising of the sun even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But you profaned it in that you say the table of the Lord is polluted and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. You said also, behold, what a weariness it is. That ye have snuffed at it, and ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn and lame and sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male. If you know anything about the law, they were to bring a male of the first year, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, without spot, without blemish, without any uh, uh, defect, and they were to offer it. And he said, Cursed is the man that has in his flock a male, and then voweth and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For he said, I'm a great king. <laughs> you're not dealing with the homeless. You're not dealing with a bum. I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts. And my name is dreadful. It is awful. It is terrible. And those are phrases to us today just really rock us back. But what they mean is it's awe-inspiring and terrifying to despise the holy name that is above every name. He said, 
Malachi 2 and verse 2. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Have we not all one Father? Verse 10. Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? You see, the horizontal relationship is affected by the vertical relationship. God says, you pollute my table. You don't know what you're causing, difficulties you're causing to your brethren. I'm going to say it again. Neither you nor your immediate family nor this church family can ever reach the potential God ordained without your faithful stewardship. Hello? It's not just God doesn't get it. The work of God and the workers of God do not get it. I mean, you get it. <laughs> you understand where I'm coming from, all right? Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. For I am the Lord, or Malachi 3 and 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. You read the book of Exodus and you find the um, multiple miracles that God performed for Israel in the 40 years in spite of their waywardness. But if you really want a spiritual biography of Israel, read the book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is saying the same thing here that God said in Malachi. Even from the days of your fathers, you've been pronged to ignore me. Even when they came out of Egypt, they brought their idols and their gods with them. When Jacob's wives came out of, of the land of Laban, they brought their father's gods with them. And God said, you've practiced this even from the days of your fathers. You have gone away from my ordinances, and you have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But instead of saying, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank God there is hope. No. He says, but ye said, wherein shall we return? We'll get to verse 8 next week, okay? So to this day, the primary principles of God's word from Genesis 1, 1, all the way through to this present hour, have not changed. The reasons given in the Old Testament for tithing are not outdated. So God is interested not in your wallet or your purse. He said, I own the gold and the mountains and the silver. All of it is mine. I own the cattle of a thousand hills. If I was hungry, I wouldn't ask you for a bite. Hello, it's not your purse nor your wallet that God's interested in. It's your heart. Samuel, don't you dare anoint that firstborn, for God sees not as men see, for God looks upon the heart. Deuteronomy 6 and 4 and through 5, 6 and 7, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's a revelation that the whole world needs to know. The paganism of multi-gods and multi-persons of God. Amen. But he said, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Now, as a result of this revelation, there should be a godly response. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thine heart. That's right up front. Because if we get the heart right, everything else will line up. But if you try to line everything else up and you don't get the heart right, there will always be big and griping and grumbling and ducking and dodging and, and, and uh, loopholes here and loopholes there. You don't read the Word of God to find a way out. You read the Word of God to know who the way is and then walk pleasingly before Him in all things. So God's interested, not in your wallet or your purse, but in your heart. And we can go on through that. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 23 and 23, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and uh, understanding. And he goes on to say in verse 26, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. If I want to guard my heart, the safest way I can guard it is put it in the hands of God and let him keep 
keep it and teach me his ways. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy truths. Make me to understand righteousness. Lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Guide me beside still waters. Help me to learn how to sit down and or lay down and hold my tongue and not even eat in green pastures until you give me the go ahead. I have been known to teach holiness from the 23rd Psalm. The first thing a sheep that's been in a pen all night long wants to do when he gets to green pasture. Hello? Same thing you want to do whenever you break fast. You want to eat. That's natural. But that sheep is trained. It's mama trains it. The older trains the younger. And when that shepherd walks into a green field and he stops, all the flock stops. He takes his staff off and stabs it in the ground, pulls his robe off and rapes it around that staff and every sheep lays down right where it is. It is free to eat as far as its little neck will stretch, but that's as far as it can eat. And yet it wants to get out into the lush green pasture. Why are we here, shepherd? What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. That shepherd's going to walk north and south all through that field. Then he's going to turn east and west and walk all through that field. He's looking for noxious plants. He's looking for vipers. He's looking for anything that would be hurtful of his flock. And once he assures himself that it's all safe for the sheep, he walks back. And whenever he walks over and picks up his coat or his cloak and puts it on, every sheep stands just trembling. Uh, they probably already got that juiciest spot planned out. Uh, and then when he brings that staff out of the ground, they burst like uh, when you, what is it? Uh, I'm not that good with it. So I, uh, billiards, is that, that, that the proper word for it? When I grew up, it was just pool, Okay. But and then when I got the Holy Ghost, I was preached that it was wrong, and so I quit playing pool. Well, show me in the Bible where I can't play pool. Well, I can. I really can. Come see me. It's found in the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews where it says, Remember and obey them that have the rule over you. I had a young man ask me one time. He said, Brother Lashley, is it all right for women to wear dresses down to the base of their knee? I said, of course. He said, well, why can't I wear shorts down to the base of my knee? He said, can you show me in the Bible where I can't do that? And that's the scripture I showed him. I said, as long as you're here, that's the scripture. One of these days, the Lord's going to call me to pastor, and then I'll just, <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, God's only interest in your, in your attitude towards your money. Uh, let me strike the word out. Did I leave your in there? God's only interest in your attitude toward money, as we had ought to read, is that it openly reveals your attitude toward him. I don't care what you say about God. Let me find out your attitude toward money, and I'll tell you exactly what your attitude toward God is. Either it shows loving, faithful stewardship or it shows selfishness. 1 Timothy 6 and 10 says the love of money, somebody help me, is the root of all evil. Matthew 6 and 24, Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon is just a Polynesian word for money. You can't. You just can't. In Romans chapter 6, verse 17 through 18, now, we're not talking about money. We're not talking about stewardship here. We're talking about salvation. But the principles often are interchangeable. God be thanked. What are we going to thank God for? That you were. How many can remember when you were the servants of sin? When you walked according to the lust of your own mind. When you walked according to the prince and the power of the air. When you walked according to the ways of the world. You were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed. Come on, help me. Come on, because somebody told you if you didn't, you're going to go to hell. No, that's not going to do it. It may cause little ones and shallow ones to run to an altar screaming for mercy, but if you're going to live for God, it's going to have to be one of these days when you get a hold, it gets a hold of your heart and you obey from your heart. That form of teaching, doctrine that was delivered unto you, being then made free, somebody help me, Free from sin, what did you do? Just sat down and kicked your heels up and said, wow, I got it made. No, you became servants of... In other words, you 
spend the rest of your days anticipating, contemplating, and following through on what's right in the sight of God. Hello? Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. See, Jesus is not interested in how much you give. He's interested in how much you care about giving. Matthew chapter 12, or Mark 12, 41, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld, somebody help me with that, that little word. Wow. Do you ever stop to thank God wondering how he's seeing how you give? Or even whether you give or not? Or how you excuse yourself? Hello? You just can't teach this, folks, without getting right down to brass tacks. I, I can't be philosophical. Okay? Nebulous, cloudy, oh, foggy. Oh, no. Jesus said over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. How many ever remember reading where he said, you don't sound a trumpet when you give? Anybody got any idea what that really meant? The coffers were made sort of like old spit tunes used to be. Big bottoms come out, then they neck down, and they come up like a trumpet and opened up. And a person with a keen ear could tell by the trumpet's sound, was it copper, was it brass, was it silver, or was it gold? The Lord said, so you ought not be interested in sounding a trumpet. You ought to be interested in showing your love and faithfulness to God. He said, and there were there, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. That means it was just a fraction of a penny. That's all she had, a fraction of a penny. And he called unto him his disciples, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast in to the treasury. Now you can take it, all of them put together, or any one of them with his most. For all they did cast in of their abundance, their slush fund, their extra unneeded. Won't cost me a thing, I just, you know, I had it laying around. But she, of her want, of her necessity, of her dire poverty, did cast in all that she had, even all her living. They didn't have refrigerators back in those days. They worked. They went in the morning. They worked till night. They got paid for that day. And women did not get paid like men. A penny a day was the wages of a man. She brought all she made that day. It was just two little mites, a fraction of a penny. And God moved on her heart, and she gave it all. That meant that night she was not going to have a candle because she had to buy one to burn before she went to bed. That meant she was not going to have any oil. That meant she wasn't going to have any bread. That meant she's going to go to her bed hungry. Jesus said, out of her Want out of her extreme poverty, she gave all that she had. I want to be open to God that if He says all, I don't try to figure pennies. In fact, over the years, I have never figured my ties to a penny. Merciful sake, if you're gonna, um, what do they call it at Goodwill? You want to round it up? For goodwill, why on earth can't we round it up for God? <laughs> Make it easier on the guys that count the money anyhow. Okay. The NIV puts it this way. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. 
Now, last week we studied about faithful stewardship, the key to a joyful life, a joy-filled life in the kingdom. Tonight we're studying faithful stewardship. It's the realization of the total fulfillment in the kingdom. Lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Moth, rust, thieves, break through and take that. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where none of that takes place. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And if your treasure is not secure, your heart's not secure. But if your treasure is secure, then so your heart is secure. Can I turn that back around? I know you can't always play like that. It's sort of like all horses are quadrupegs. means they're four-legged. But all quadrupegs are not horses. The chair you're sitting on is a quadruped. But in this particular instance, you can take where your treasure is, there your heart is, and turn it right back around and say, and where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Okay? Matthew chapter 19. It was, and we mentioned him earlier, a rich young man, a ruler, the scripture calls him, and he came running to Jesus. And he talked to the Lord, and they, they just, uh, discussed uh, commandments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And the guy said, all of this I've done all my life. I've gone to Sunday school. i got more pins to show how many times I haven't missed than you can imagine. I have always been there. And the Lord looks at him in verse 21 and said, if thou wilt be perfect. Why settle for second when you can be first? Why settle for also ran when you could win? Hello? And the whole question is here, is it in your heart? Do you want to be perfect? If Do you want to be rich or do you want to be perfect? That's what the Lord's asking him. He's saying to him, if thou wilt be perfect, and the word there is teleos, you can go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. Come follow me. Now some scholars put this same rich young ruler in the story of the prosperous farmer in, what is it, Mark, Luke 16, where he talks about a certain man fared sumptuously every day, etc. Poor Lazarus begged. Angels bore him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and in hell lifted his eyes because the Lord had said to him, tonight you're going to die. You fool, tonight you're going to die. He wasn't a fool because he didn't know how to farm. He was a fool because he didn't know how to put his treasure in God. And he said, then whose are these going to be too? Some folks try to tie that together. I don't even worry with it. It's just there for us to understand. In the complete word study dictionary, you can look that up for yourself, you that are online, the word teleos means complete, full, wanting and nothing. When it is used in a moral sense, referring to God's expectation of us, but actually, you mean God expects anything out of me? I really thought God existed for me. I really thought God just hung around to hear me pray and to help me out. You'd be surprised how many people seem to live with that mentality. God? The story says they were on a river boat years and years and years ago. And they were running up on the edge of a barge, hit a snag or something, or a sandbar, hit a snag or something. And this very wealthy lady was on the boat. She came to the captain. She said, oh, captain, captain, is there anything that I can do? And he turned to her and he said, yes, ma'am, you can pray. Oh, my God, she said, has it come to that? (laughs) Well, that ought to be the way we start our day. When this word teleos, or perfect, is used in a moral sense. Would you be morally perfect in the sight of God? It means God's expectations of us, completely blameless before the Lord. None of us live faultless. The only thing I know that's faultless is starch, and that's just a brand name. James says, Pastor, help me. James chapter whatever He says, we offend all. It's an old English way of saying, there's not a one of you that hasn't somewhere, somehow offended somebody. We don't do it necessarily on purpose, but we are a very offensive people. Hello? Okay. 
It's, we're not faultless, but because of the blood of Christ and our faithfulness to him. You know the Old Testament that Paul quotes in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, that the just shall live by faith. In Habakkuk, where it's originally spoken, it says, and the just shall live by his faith. And the word for faith there doesn't just mean his trust. It means his trust and his fidelity to God and to the covenant of God. He's going to be faithful. Hello? You too. You're married, pledged to be a faithful to one another. You trust one another and maintain your own fidelity. That's what keeps your marriage going. That's what keeps our walk with God going. Hello? And when we stumble and fall, anybody ever stumbled and fail walking with God? What do you do? Hide and pretend it didn't happen? Hello? Someone said you sweep it under the carpet. Well, you know, you sweep enough under the carpet, you can't get the door open. No, you don't sweep it under the carpet. You put it under the blood. You confess, and he's faithful and just to forgive, and I've gotten nowhere, okay? Moving on, James chapter 1, verse 4. Let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect, that is blameless, entire, complete, wanting nothing, okay? What does that mean? It means to keep yourself unspotted from the world. It means to keep yourself in the love of God. As Jesus said in 1 John 2 and 5, or John 15 and 9, continue in my love even as I have continued in my Father's love. It means hating even the garment that is spotted by the flesh. Not by the world, not by the devil, but by my own flesh. Hello? Lay up for yourself, not treasures in the earth, but in heaven. Okay? Moving along. John chapter 5, verse 6. The man's at the pool of Bethesda. He's been there 38 years. He's a man with great infirmity. And Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd been there now a long time. And he asked him a simple question. You want to get better? Is that what he asked him? You want me to heal you? Is that what he asked him? Wilt thou be made whole? Hello? The ten lepers that came, nine of them got healed. Well, one of them looked at his healing and ran back and fell on his face and said, Lord, I want to worship you and give you glory. Jesus said, where's the other nine? This, only this one has come back to give praise. And he looked at him and he said, thou art made whole. Thy faith has made thee whole. There's a difference in being healed and being made whole. You can be healed and still have a limp. But when you're made whole, it's all straightened out. You can be healed of leprosy and still have the scars. But when you are totally made whole, there are no scars. Aren't you glad the blood of a lamb can cover the scars and nobody knows what kind of life you live before the blood? Woo! The blood. Oh, hallelujah. Sister Schick, the night she got the Holy Ghost, she come run up the pulpit, and she's, oh, Brother Lashley, Brother Lashley, I'm so thankful God gave me the Holy Ghost tonight. He really gave me the Holy Ghost tonight. And she said, oh, I'm so happy to be here. And then she said, if you people knew my past, you wouldn't let me park my car in your parking lot, much less attend your church. I said, Sister Schick, if you knew our past, you wouldn't want to park your car in our parking lot. Aren't you glad the blood covers the past? And gives us a chance of a new beginning. Wilt thou be made whole? So here's some questions. Do you want to be whole? Or do you just want to get by? Do you want to be perfect? Or you just want a dollar's worth of God? Maybe three dollars worth. Do you want to be completely blameless before God? Do you want to be perfect and entire and not wanting anything? Nothing's missing. Do you want to fulfill all God's expectations of you? A certain man in Matthew chapter 5 called his servants together and said, I'm fixing to go on a long journey. And I'm going to give to you five talents. And I'm going to give to you two talents. And I'm going to give to you, little lady, one. And he gave them all to him and left immediately on his journey. The man with five talents was industrious and made another five. The man with the two, likewise, another two. But the man with one, you know, sometimes we can be so envious of the multiple things God's using other folks to do, we take our little nest egg and bury it in a hole. Well, he didn't give me much. He gave you all he could trust you with. And more that you prove trustworthy of. 
Hello? He knows he's not going to burden you with more than you can do. If you can't do five, he'll give you two. If you can't do two, he wants you to be included. He'll give you one. At least you can be faithful with what he gives you. And the Bible said when he came back, the man with five came running and said, Master, Master. Sounded to me like he was looking for his return. Sounded to me like there happened to be a, a bond of affection between him and the master. You trusted me, and I want you to know that I took what you gave me, and I doubled it, and here it is. The Lord said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Hello? And then this man with two, same thing. And here comes a guy with one. I knew you. I knew your very nature was harsh and hard and mean. One translation says, I figured that if I made a profit, you'd take it away from me. What kind of an attitude do we get from the first two and the latter one? I'm talking about stewardship from the heart, folks. Stewardship from the heart. I don't know about you, but I think you feel like I do about this. I would that God would help me to fulfill all he expects of me. I want to do all. I want to be found blameless in his sight. Now, God's got a divine plan for salvation, new birth. God's got a divine plan for spiritual growth, desire the sincere milk of the word. And God's got a divine plan for stewardship. You lay up treasures in heaven. Hello. And you make up your mind. I want to be perfect in the sight of God. And you bring you a tithe and your offering according to the scripture. Pastor's been talking about divine order, bringing divine glory, which sets us up for divine blessing or divine judgment. Oh, God, show me your glory. Are you sure you want to see his glory? You sure you want to see God manifest? Because when God invests his glory, he expects you to respect his glory. Hello? A man by the name of Yuza taught David a real lesson about honoring the glory of God. Isaiah 55 and 11. I don't know if this is in your notes or not. You might want to jot it down. The Lord said, My word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that for which I please. It will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God's word will establish salvation in our life or it will establish a baseline for divine judgment in our life. We will be judged. We'll either be saved by the word or judged by the word. I just really want to be perfect in his sight. Faithful stewardship, the realization of a total fulfillment in God's kingdom. Saints have an inheritance in this world and the one to come. Grace and truth that gives us life, love, liberty, unity, righteousness, peace, joy, fulfillment in the Holy Ghost. God's laws are grace and truth, life, liberty, unity, righteousness, peace, joy, and fulfillment in the Holy Ghost. God is the creator, redeemer, and savior. He's a designer, not a dictator. His laws are consequential, not compelling. They're not to control, but to enable life, liberty, blessings, freedom, righteousness, peace, joy, and fulfillment in the Holy Ghost. God's laws work because they're graciously based in love, truth, life, and righteousness. Colossians 3 and 20 says, Children, obey your parents in all things. Ephesians 6 and 2 says, Honor thy father and thy mother. Question, why are children to obey and honor their parents in all things? Hello? Hello? Well, let me just cut through the chase and say, because God said so. Someone asked me one time, he said, Brother Lashley, do you really believe that God didn't mean uh, fermented grape, uh, grape uh, wine, grape wine, when he said the wine? I said, well, unless you can find fermented grape wine in the cluster on the vine, no, he didn't mean that. Well, Brother Lashley, why? I said, look, fella, as far as I'm concerned, if I was in a foxhole somewhere and all I had was soda crackers and water, I'd celebrate communion. 
And I wouldn't ask you whether you approved or not. I'd leave it in the hands of God who judges my heart. God could have said buttermilk and cornbread if God had said it. Hello? But he said the fruit of the vine and the bread. All right. Why are children to obey and honor their parents in all things? Sometimes when I'm discussing a subject, I just love to bounce off of the wall like playing a handball. Bang! Why are children to obey and honor their parents? How many you know that is the most important lesson you'll ever teach your child for the first 10 years of its life? And if the child doesn't learn to honor and obey in the first 10 years of its life, it's going to have a hard struggle for the rest of its life. A twig is easier to bend, honey, than a sapling. And a sapling's even easier to bend than a full-grown tree. And so it just needs to be done in time. Why do they honor and obey? Well, let's go back to Colossians 3.20. For this is well-pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Well, I just don't, I don't care what you don't. I care about what he does. Ephesians 6 and 2, it's the first commandment with promise. Wow. I got all the others that are before. What do we have? Four commandments, then we get to the fifth one. Is, is it thou shalt honor thy father and mother? I should have looked it up where it would be fresh in my mind. I know there's two tablets. The first tablets were a relationship with God, and the other tablets was a relationship with people, and it started with the parents. Okay. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12 says, Obey your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Well, I know a guy, he hated his mom and dad, and he lived to be a hundred. Well, if he had loved them, he might have lived to be two. You don't judge the word of God by people. People will be judged by the word of God. Why are God's people to tithe and give offerings? <laughs> Did I get there off of the wall? A, to follow in the steps of the faith of Abraham. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4 that we are to follow in the steps of the father Abraham, who is the father of the faithful. Now, Abraham had three-pronged steps. Number one, he had confidence, uh, a commitment to God, our confidence in God. The judge, the judge of all the earth shall do right, Genesis 25 and 18. No, 18, 25. All right. And then he had a commitment to God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Not knowing where he's going, he just obeyed and went. And then he had a consistent follow-through with God. The Bible says that he so adjourned in tents with uh, Isaac and Jacob as heirs of the promise. He built an altar when he got the Hebron. He went to Egypt. He come back to the place of the altar and built it again. And then he built another altar and another altar. Oh, it would have been a wonderful thing if Lot had have learned to build an altar. He would have saved his family perhaps. But Abraham was an altar builder and the last altar he built. And you notice something about building altars? Let me tell you something about building altars. They describe your consecration. And every altar is bigger than the last one. Because God keeps asking for more. And more and more until he's got all. And you're walking well pleasing before him. The last altar Abraham built was in Genesis chapter 22. That is, we have a record of. And that altar was big enough to lay his son on. His whole life, his dreams, his hopes, his future. Everything, the promises of God seem to be contradicted by this. But he obeyed God and God intervened. We pay tithes and give offerings to follow in the steps of faithful Abraham. According to Genesis 17, 18, and 20, he paid tithes to Melchizedek. Number two, Genesis 28, we pay tithes as thanksgiving. Thanks for God's promises. Thanks for God's provision. Thanks for God's protection. Thanksgiving and giving go hand in hand. Show me a person that is not faithful in their tithes and offerings, and I'll show you a person that is not really thankful. They are in the mixed crowd. When Moses led Israel out of Egypt, there was a mixed multitude that came with them. And every problem that they had except Korah came out of the mixed multitude. 
They just wanted to go with the people that were blessed. They didn't really want to commit to the God that blessed them. Bear with me, please. When Jacob found God in his life, he found God in everything, everywhere. He found the omnipresent anointing, and he pledged tithe of all. Thirdly, I have to pay tithes and give offerings not only to be thankful, but I just want to be honest and be blessed. Now we go to how shall we return to you? Verse 8 of that third chapter of Malachi says, Will a man rob God? You've robbed me. You say, Where? And he answered, In tithe and offerings. As a result, you're cursed with a curse. You robbed me, the whole nation. Hey, folks, I don't care if everybody's not doing it. I want to do it. Bring you all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He will not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Why are children to honor and obey their parents? For the same reason saints are supposed to tithe and give offerings because God who knows best said so God's laws work get your little budget out get your little pencil out and do all the figuring you want to and you can cut anything out of that budget that you can but don't cut God out hello God expects his people to show their love and loyalty to him and his work by giving tithes and offerings to promote his purpose on earth for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. We want, I personally want to be a part of reaching the whole world with the whole gospel by the whole church. I want the spirit of Ruth. Where you go, I'm going. I'm going to serve your God, et cetera, and et cetera. Blessings that go along with faithfulness and financial giving will be here and hereafter. Matthew 25, well done, thou good and faithful Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. Now, I have, and let me skip here. If you'll just give me, please, five more minutes. Give me till 20 till. All right? I will finish. 1 Corinthians 1, 22, 23. Paul said, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not yet as to Corinth. In other words, he said, I'd like to come be with you, but right now if I come, it's going to be painful. So he said, to spare you, I have not yet come. But he writes on, not that we have dominion over your faith. You're an adult. You're going to believe what you want to believe. I don't care what Brother Lassa says. I remember when we were first talking about building a church. Individual in the church said, well, that's what he thinks he wants, but that ain't what he's going to get. Well, we built it. Then we start talking about putting... Red carpet. Anybody here old enough to remember the red carpet that changed colors on us? It faded. Some, how many of you can remember the red carpet on the little low platform? An individual said, if you put red carpet in that church, I ain't never coming again. So long. <laughs> Been good knowing you. You know, if you run from everything, every threat that comes your way, you'll be like Chicken Little running in circles. We do not have dominion over your faith. You're going to believe what you want to believe. You can sit under my teaching until I, I run out of breath and still not believe a word of what I say. That's between you and God. But he said, but we are heifers of your joy. I have wept many a tear over many a situation that was needlessly tearful if they had just let me help their joy. What's Brother Lashley trying to do? Present you without spot and blameless before the Lord. Now, you have power over what you're going to believe, but what you believe has power over you. Believe what you will, but you cannot change the consequences of what you choose to believe. Everything you believe brings with it consequences. What you believe has the power to bless or to curse, to heal or to terminate, to save or to destroy. You and everybody you have influence over.
The real question is, what do you truly believe about God, about his word, about salvation, about stewardship, about life, joy, peace, contentment, fulfillment? Let me say it again. Neither you nor your immediate family nor this local church family will ever reach the full potential God's ordained without your faithful stewardship. Faithful stewardship is the key to a joy-filled life. Faithful stewardship is the realization of fulfillment. Did I throw a scripture at you there? Matthew 11, verse 28, 29, 30. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. That's uh, the Sabbath. I'll give you the Holy Ghost. That is the spirit of rest. That's the rest of the New Testament. Then he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. There are some lessons you cannot learn until you get obligated. Hello? Until you get committed, there are lessons in life you'll never learn. You're going to have to get in the harness. You have to take the yoke. It's not my yoke. It's his yoke. It's only in his yoke will you learn the spiritual pace and the spiritual stride that you need to have. You can't learn that out of the yoke. I've seen people that have been around Pentecost for decades, and they have never found their spiritual pace nor their spiritual stride. They're still bumping along just like a bobber loose in the stream. Just boom to boom to boom to boom. Bang against this and bang against that. But if you would just get in the harness. And the Lord said, my yoke's easy. My burden's light. And he said, learn of me. And then what else did he say? He said, you're going to make the discovery of your life. I'm not only going to give you rest. That's the Holy Ghost. But you're going to find rest. Anybody ever seen folks live for God like they're killing snakes? I mean, every day is, oh, God, the devil's after me. Ah! I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it or not. Why, somebody help me. Come on. That bunch of nonsense is because you're not in the yoke. Hey, I'm not the pastor. It's not my office you're going to be sitting in griping. You're going to find rest. What is it? Hebrews talks about that uh, you find rest when you cease from your own works. Quit trying to be a hot shot. Quit trying to be something. Why don't you just put yourself in the hands of God like a piece of clay in the potter's hand? Stand with me. I've got about eight or ten things down through there that I choose to believe. You got them. I agree with Joshua, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to do it in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I choose to honor God with my tithe and offering as per his holy word, and I choose never to be a robber of God. I choose, and so do you. The real question is what do you really choose to believe? Do you want to be whole? Do you really want to be blameless? Do you want to fulfill all God's expectations of you? Not your expectations of God. Your expectations of me. Your expectations of the pastor. Your expectations of the church. Did I tell you the story about the man that came to me and said, Brother Lashley, I know you're fixing to build a church. You're going into a building program, and I know you need money. And he made good money. I said, don't you say another word. If you say what I think you're about to say, I'll never be able to respect you ever again. There's no red light on my front porch. You folks that don't know anything about the red light sector don't know what that means. I'm not a prostitute. You don't buy me. I don't work for you. I work with you, but I work for him. And I was working for him before I ever knew you. Hello? Hello? And I looked at him and I said, I want you to know I'm not a prostitute. And I lived 26 years before I ever heard your name, much less saw a penny of your tithe or offering. And as far as I'm concerned, I can live 26 more years without any of your name or your money. Folks, if everyone in POP faithfully and systematically tithed and gave offerings according to God's blessings in their life, then this church would never lack anything in doing all of God's calling.
Now Jesus said, these things I've spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy may be full. And I have struggled. I could have pulled out last year's lesson. You'd found one or two similarities, but I promise you, it just didn't fit. In the same spirit of Jesus, I'm trying to teach you how to be fulfilled. People who are fulfilled in God are not enticed by the world nor intimidated by the world. They're full of the joy of the Holy Ghost. They find total fulfillment. I'm in the will of God. I'm doing the will of God. They don't backslide because they're all about the kingdom of God. If it's good for the kingdom, it's good for my family. If it's not good for the kingdom, I don't care what it looks like. It's not good for me or my family. They're all about God's righteousness, about, not about themselves or this world. They found that the joy of the Lord is their never-failing strength. So I close by saying, be generous. Be a blessing. Be blessed. Father, I thank you for your divine order of salvation. I thank you for your divine order of spiritual growth. And I thank you for your divine order of stewardship. I pray that you would help each of us discover that key of a joy-filled life and to realize the fullness of fulfillment in serving you. Keep your hand upon every family. Bless every family, every member of every family, and every individual that visits this assembly or calls this their church home. Secure us in yourself and in your righteousness, I pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.